Hello, and welcome to the webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Noe Santos with the Bureau of Reclamation in the Lower Colorado region, and we are very pleased to have Dr. Kelly mont a Senior Research Analyst with the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Arizona. Her research examines environmental flow needs in arid systems and process design for effective stakeholder engagement in water management. Kelly is also the co-lead for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative Critical Management Question 1 team, which is hosting the webinar. This webinar will cover the environmental flow database, which will result in a DLCC-wide database of environmental flow needs and responses to help water and land, and man and land managers make management decisions. This project will identify critical data gaps in flow need and flow response data in the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative area, and will result in a user-friendly one-stop shop for managers and researchers for existing data on flow needs and responses in the, the DLCC region. Thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you Kelly for sharing this work with us. I will now hand the reins over to Kelly to begin her presentation. Great, thank you very much, Noe. And one of the things I'd like to em emphasize before I get going is that um, if, as I'm going through the database or if something occurs to you afterwards, in terms of usability in particular, um, to please let me know either through the, the comments or shoot me an email afterwards because this is, while this is the final database, I'm, we're, you know, very concerned with making sure that people understand how to use it and how and it, that it is accessible. So that's the ultimate goal. And if you see some things, have some suggestions for what we could do to change that, I would um, love to hear them. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Kelly Mott Lacroix, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Elia Tapia, who is a graduate student here at the Water Resources Research Center, who has done a lot of work on this project, as well as uh, Dr. Abraham Springer from Northern Arizona University, who has been um, helping us on this project as well. In case you're, uh, in case you haven't downloaded it yet, I know many of you have because I've been getting the emails. Here's the website for where the database itself is. You don't need to have it downloaded in order to go through the um, to kind of participate today, but just so you've got it there. So if you're not familiar with the um, Water Resources Research Center, we are a cooperative extension unit and research unit of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Arizona in Tucson. We, um, our mission for the University, uh, for the Water Resources Research Center, is that we promote understanding of critical state and regional water management and policy issues through research, community outreach and engagement, and public education. And in particular, I manage a program at the Water Resources Research Center called Water Rapids, which stands for Research and Planning uh, Innovations in Dry Land Systems. I'm actually missing a word there. Um, and the goal of the Water Rapids program is to help communities balance a secure water future for residential, commercial, and industrial um, and agricultural sectors with the water needs of natural areas. So this sort of work really plays into um, our goals as a program in order to try to provide data and um, understanding of uh, water for natural areas. So we've been working on this project with Northern Arizona University, the Watershed Ecohydrology Program, and that program uh, coordinates and conducts comprehensive research to inform ecosystem management practices that affect hydrologic systems. And the program provides the best available science to decision makers, which is part of what we're working on here, while educating the next generation of multidisciplinary water resource professionals. So to kind of get us started, and perhaps even getting us all on the same page, I imagine many of you on, uh, on the call on this webinar or watching it are very familiar with environmental flows, the definition of which, and kind of thinking about um, environmental flows. But just to make sure we're all kind of thinking around the same ideas, I'm defining environmental flows as the amount of water needed, either surface water and or groundwater, to sustain a healthy ecosystem, which is simple to say, of course, and difficult to do. And what we've done in this database and in this work is really frame um, environmental flows and the database around the elements of the natural flow regime. So if we think about surface water and groundwater, and we take one species in particular, and, and here I'm talking about uh, cottonwood, and we think about the different stages, life stages of cottonwoods, it's not just, you know, natural flow regime of one type, it's for all the different life stages in this space. And we think about the first element of the natural flow regime, which is magnitude, so how much. You can apply that pretty easily to um, both surface water flows. You see there, for example, 1.4 cubic meters per second of surface water flows. And these are all data from some of the studies within the database. Um, or uh, in terms of groundwater levels, 
you know, a mature cottonwood um, needs between 1.4 uh, one to, point, uh, to four meters uh, depth um, below surface in order for its roots to, roots to go for groundwater. And then you think about timing. So it's not just the amount of water that occurs, it's when does that water occur. An example of that would be if you look there at the mature cottonwood again, there's a study that talks about how in the summertime uh, depths of water cannot exceed uh, three meters. It needs to be less than three meters deep. So that's an example of timing, one of, one of many. Um, and then frequency, how often does the flow occur? So, for example, um, one study talks about needing different uh, types of peak flows every one to three years or every one to ten years. Those are those white um, uh, numbers there. The um, duration, so how long does a flow occur for? In this case, it was easiest but for the purpose of this graphic just to talk about uh, a year-round flow, base flows. That's in the green there over on the left. And then rate of change. How quickly does um, you, do you go from a peak to a valley uh, in terms of talking about surface flows in the hydrograph? Or um, in terms of how quickly does the um, water, uh, water level recede in terms of talking about groundwater? So you can see example of um, a range from studies on seedlings saying two centimeters to less than 4.4 centimeters per day, or for mature cottonwood, 100 centimeters per year rate of change. And one of the perhaps most difficult things about thinking about environmental flows is that it's not just the science, it's also thinking about priority setting. What sort of system are we managing for by communities and land and water managers? So in order to um, talk about and manage for environmental flows, we really have two questions we have to answer. What sort of ecosystem do we want or are we managing for? And what sort of data exists to help us provide that quote unquote right amount of water to the resource, understanding that it's very difficult to get to a single number. And so this database, this flows work, really tries to um, help answer that second question. So a little bit of uh, information about the evolution of the Desert Flows database. It started in 2010 with a project funded um, by the Nina Mason Polyam Charitable Trust and to the Water Resources Research Center, and through that funding we produced um, something called the Arizona Environmental Flow Needs Assessment. And that assessment was a, um, a document that we created that looked at flow needs and flow responses from 91 different studies in the state of Arizona. We then took that information, expanded it by about 30 to 40 studies, and in 2012 created the Arizona Environmental Water Demands Database. We um, this database attracted the attention of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, and um, they decided to uh, provide support for a um, revision and expansion to create a database similar to the one from Arizona, although not the same, uh, to encompass all of the deserts of the U.S. and Mexico. So before we got started on this um, expansion of the Arizona version of the database, we decided to do a survey of land and water managers to both review the uh, methodology and the format, as well as to get some ideas on the types of information that are used and needed. So we could really hone in on um, the types of information we pulled out of all of these studies we were going to read. So at the end of 24, uh, 2014, we released a survey. It was both in English and in Spanish uh, to uh, land and water managers and other interested parties in the U.S. and Mexico. We received 47 uh, responses. Just a little bit of information about the survey results because it helped us reshape the database. <coughs> Excuse me, um, to kind of give you some ideas. Is, and if you're interested in some more of these survey results, I'd be happy to share you with share them with you later. But what we found is that 56% of uh, people who answered the survey did not currently use flow data in their management and planning. Of those who did, the most um, uh, data that were the most important were information like depth of groundwater. Uh, amount of surface water flows, and the legal regulatory requirements for species. Um, the most commonly indicated information needed for management was the link between groundwater depths and surface water flows, and information about the links between hydrology and species abundance, age structure, and survivorship. Overall, um, folks commented that what they really would like the database to look like is updated, reliable, easy to access, comprehensive, and integrated, and um, which includes both quantitative and qualitative scientific information on aquatic and riparian systems and visual graphics of metrics. And that last part in particular is going to come um, with our gap analysis study, which I'll talk about at the very end, where we're taking all of this information from the database and doing some analysis of, of it to try to 
get at what do we know and what don't we know um, about flow needs and flow responses for riparian and aquatic systems in the um, deserts of the U.S. and Mexico. So what is the Desert Flows database? It is a tabular database of available peer-reviewed articles and agency reports on environmental flow needs and responses for flora and fauna in the watersheds of the deserts of the U.S. and Mexico. And I have that bolded there, and you'll see in the, um, in the graphic beside it that the yellow is the boundary of the DLCC, the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. We expanded um, our search for articles beyond and information beyond just the boundaries of the DLCC to all of the watersheds, although I will say that at the top there, um, there in, in the Nevada area, it, it went pretty high up into the Great Basin. We didn't go too far up into there because it was, um, wasn't really feasible with the time we had. But, um, and, and we tried to make sure that we weren't losing any studies or cutting off streams kind of unnecessarily and, and by taking a water, more of a watershed approach. The database also includes um, a spatial layer of reaches where flow needs and flow responses have been observed, modeled, or recommended. And importantly, and I'll talk about this if we have time at the end, um, in order to even get started on this database, we had to do a fair amount of work creating a unified spatial layer of perennial, perennial streams for the U.S. and Mexico within the boundaries of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And that involved merging the NHC in um, the U.S. to uh, the INEHI uh, data in Mexico. <coughs> so to build the database, <coughs> just a little bit about the methodology, we looked at 19 different search engines, ranging from Web of Science and Google Scholar to um, agency uh, websites like Research, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as state um, state agency websites. For each one of these search engines, we use a series of search criteria, and you see the graphic down there at the bottom. For example, looking at environmental flows and uh, the Rio, you know, uh, Rio Yaqui, environmental flows and the Colorado River. So searching for each one of these criteria in each one of these search engines with each one of the rivers, states, or deserts. It was quite an extensive list um, pulling, you know, to pull together this large universe of uh, studies to potentially consider. In the end, we had 981 possible studies um, with an additional about 300 studies that came out of um, a series of reports from um, Mexico on um, individual basins. So they had just a, a bit of information on um, environmental flow requirements. Those studies, those Mexico studies, uh, did not end up making it into the uh, database. And we can talk a little bit more about that um, later because they were very, very general but that we do have those all recorded if you're interested. Um, we did a kappa analysis as we um, analyzed the different studies, did a quick analysis to see if we should include it or should not include it in the database, and found out that my colleague Ellie and I had differing opinions on what should be included and what shouldn't. As a result, we went back and looked at about two to 300 studies that we had rejected to review them and see if they should be included in the database. And um, it was a smaller number of uh, studies that we had rejected. A lot of the studies we pulled in actually ended up not being in our geography. <coughs> so we managed all of the literature for, this, um, for the database through uh, a, an open source um, manager called Zotero. And we are planning to um, remove all of the copyrighted material from this Zotero database and then make it publicly available. So you'll have all of the citations, but, um, but then also have access to the actual publications for those that aren't um, behind a, a paywall. That's something that uh, actually came up to the, just this week with a, a colleague of mine asking if we could share that information. And so we're going to go through and do that in the next couple of weeks. So if you're interested in actually getting a, uh, access to the actual reports that came into the database, let me know, and I'd be happy to invite you to that group once we have it established. And what you can see here is um, the, the column that says extra is the ID for every single, every single study has a unique ID. So the one that's highlighted there is um, throughout the database is labeled as number 200. And that's how they're all connected throughout all the tables. So what's inside the uh, Desert Flows database? Ultimately, we ended up with 408 studies, which included reports, peer-reviewed, and book chapters, peer-reviewed journal articles and um, uh, book chapters which cover 144 rivers and springs in the uh, desert watersheds of the U.S. and Mexico, 
and uh, 312 uh, species or, um, and genera. So just in case you're interested, the most commonly studied species that we found were cottonwoods, different types of cottonwoods, tamarisk, willows, and mesquite. <coughs> the most commonly studied rivers were the Rio Grande, which had 83 uh, different studies, the Colorado River with 73, the San Pedro with 53, the Gila River with 27, and the Bill Williams with 25. And all of these kind of facts and figures will be part of the um, gap analysis report that we'll be coming out with in, in February. So <clears throat> each one of the studies is uh, labeled and organized by both the ecoregion and the state that it is part of. So you can go through the database and find things if you're from Nevada and you want to look at all the studies in Nevada, you can search the database that way. Or if you want to see all the studies that occurred in the Mojave Desert, you can search it that way as well. So a little bit of an idea of um, both how, um, how we structured and how we're going to display the information when we put together the gap, when we finish the gap analysis report, as well as just to kind of give you an impression of where the perennial streams and springs are in, in this DLCC geography. So the database uh, contains basic information, the type of data collected, the environmental flow method that was used, um, the species or system risks and stressors, which is something new um, that we added into um, this newer version of the database. Whenever a study talks about a, a species or an ecosystem risk or stressor, we, add, we cataloged it. And um, perhaps most importantly, standardized information looking at the quantified or described data on the relationship between the ecology and surface flows or groundwater and or the riparian vegetation and fauna relationships between those two. And so um, a little bit about the methodology. <coughs> the database is, has the primary table that contains all information on, on the study. All other tables join to this one by the unique study index. That's the number that you saw there in that um, field that I showed you for Zotero. So all of the tables are many to one, the one being back to the study, um, the, the primary table, table one. So all data can be mapped. So this makes it complicated, right? You have many to many relationships. So that all data can be mapped in, in ArcGIS, we created a middle table which links river segments, and you'll see this when I show you um, some of the, uh, pull up the ArcGIS in a minute, to um, the study index. This allows for many to many relationships because many of the um, studies, for example, are on multiple streams, or one stream has many studies. You have to be able to query the database and get all of the information um, from, for any given stream or any given study, making many-to-many -many very important. So um, the tables in the database, there are um, seven, seven tables, really, seven A, B, and C are all very related. So I say seven tables um, covering vocation, methods, the elements that were in the, within the study, for example, did the study look at soil moisture? Did the study look at geomorphology? Did it include vegetation monitoring? Social aspects, wherever a study discussed things like ecosystem services or economic valuation, we included a note of that within this database. So if you're interested in trying to delve a little bit more into the human aspect of flows, we do have some information on that in the database. Risks and stressors, which I've already no noted, and then a table of flow needs, a table of flow responses, and, and relationships between flora and fauna. And this is the, the gory details on what each column and um, within the database, what the database contains. And one thing just to point out here is you'll see that um, all of the ta tables two through seven C all have a study index which relates it back to table one study info, and all of the um, tables have a unique ID for each entry. So perhaps the, one of the most important parts of this um, database is this methodology for um, standardizing all this disparate data about flow needs and flow responses. And the mechanism we used for that was taking um, key words around ecology, in this case abundance, age structure, survivorship, and reproduction, looking for those key words within each study, and then how the authors discuss their, those, the, those, the relationship with those to hydrology, so the magnitude, the frequency, the duration, the timing, and the rate of change for either surface water or groundwater. And what we do within the uh, seven A, B, and C, A, A, and B, uh, really, 
to a certain extent see as well, is connect those with a related with a connecting word that describes the relationship. So with flow needs, the connecting words are depends upon, not depend upon, uses, and we have use in there so that we could include studies that looked at evapotranspiration, even though that doesn't strictly fit into, you know, kind of the box of the natural flow regime, it's still important data to, to, to include. We didn't want to ignore it. And then flow response, influence, enhanced, or harm. So a little bit of an idea of what that looks like, how we, you know, kind of <coughs> describe this is, for example, an end result, um, and this is taken directly from kind of reading across on a line in the database, cottonwood willow forest abundance is associated with about 655 cubic feet per second every 10 to 25 years on a community type, and this community type is found on fine, loamy, over sandy complex soil. And so that's what it looks like in the database, and this is the sort of information we pulled it from. So this is a figure from a study from 1996, and um, this would be a good example also of there be multiple lines within the database to kind of describe the bits of information that are included in this figure. So you can see here that this is, here's the information on the 655 CFS, and actually it's really in the description here, stream flows of approximately 655 CFS, which flood the oldest, and at 10 to 25 um, year return intervals. And it's important to note that in, for all of these lines of the flow uh, needs and flow response data, there are comments, and there are also the page numbers and the figures that the, in, in, the original information came from. So you can always go back and see how we interpreted the information. So now I'm going to take you on a quick database tour. I'm going to come out of this here. Okay, so if you download the database from the web page and you open it up, um, this is the first thing you'll see is this flash screen. You can click here. Don't want to ever see it again. Then click close. And then what happens is you automatically get <coughs> a form. And so every study in the database, and you see here, I'm going to, oops, make it bigger. Um, every study in the database, there's 408 here down at the bottom, um, has one of these forms. And if you scroll down, you can see that it, this is pretty much bringing together all aspects of all tables into one place. So you can kind of see the, the information about each study in just one place. And this is, for those of you, if you are familiar with the Arizona database, the Arizona database never had a form like this. And I think this really helps the full information, at least individual study information together. And so each one of these pieces here is a separate table within the larger database. And obviously not all um, studies have all of the information. So for example, in this study, um, groundwater AMA review report from the Department of Water Resources, we didn't identify any discussion of risks and stressors identified. But they did have information, in this case it's evapotranspiration, um, on uh, what we ca call it as flow needs. So talking about how forested broadleaf uses 410 millimeters per year. And I should note, that within this form, you aren't seeing all of the information within the table. Just so that this form wasn't totally unruly, I kind of picked and chose uh, some of the key information. So for example, and most notably, there aren't any comments over here on, um, on these pieces of data, which are within the form that's behind it. Also, um, I've taken, and um, within the database table, most of these things, like vegetation mapping, is abbreviated, but I've pulled in the full, um, the full name for it to make it a little bit easier to look at. So, okay, so let's see. I was going to pull up just to show you a couple of these. So here, another example. See, in this case, I show the code. <coughs> so here's one on the upper Rio Grande, and you can see in this case this one had three different things that they, um, that they looked at. They looked at ecosystem flow needs. So for the whole ecosystem, so that's specifically noted as the study element. I looked at geomorphology and water quality. Um, the methods that they used in this study um, are looking at um, the indicators of hydrologic um, alteration. You can't see the alteration there at the end. So a couple of different types of studies. It's MD, and all of these um, abbreviations that are left in here are, um, you can find them within the keys over here. Um, so the data type here, these are all modeled, and CA means they were calibrated models. So trying to help you understand a little bit about the, um, 
the methods that we're using, kind of the quality of the methods. And I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism we use to assess quality of methods when I, go, when I show you that table in just a second. But you can also see that this is a study that covered um, a number of different uh, rivers so here on the location. And then if you scroll down the bottom, this isn't, this isn't, I apologize, this is the one that has flow response with the riparian uh, flora relationships. I think the other one that I was going to pull was, let's see. Yeah, so this is one that has information. This one actually is rare in that it has something in almost every single category. Um, talking about risks and stressors, the so water quality, salinity in particular, and the page number that those are discussed on, um, and then flow needs uh, for um, some riparian trees, and then uh, flow responses as well, and then some information about relationships between, and this is very general. In many cases, the studies will talk about very specific species, species to species relationships. In this case, it's just saying, you know, fish or reproduction is associated with cameras, so, which is actually kind of interesting. So that one would have a page number associated with it, and you could go investigate that further if that was um, something of interest to you. Okay, so now we're going to close out of this and um, come into, and I'll take you through the uh, tables themselves. So this is all information that's pulling from the individual tables that are over here on the side. So the first table is the study uh, study info table, and this is where all of the kind of basic information that's not really repeated or there's not multiple um, aspects of it are for every single study. So you have the title, the report author, when it was published, where it was published, what the study period is, um, if the flow was perennial, intermittent, um, ephemeral, that's indicated here. In some cases, if it was a lab study, that was that was not applicable, or if it was strictly a study of um, economics, for which we have a couple of those, um, and then a summary of the um, an aspect of the abstract, for lack of a better word, over here in the last column. So then, all other tables link back to that table. So here you have the location location information for each of the studies, and so this is that um, that column is what's linking back to the study. In, in, the, the name of the study and the authors of the study. And you can see that a number of the studies are um, on this. There's one study, but it looked at multiple different uh, river systems. So here, study 27 looks at San Pedro, Gila, Bill Williams, uh, Rio Grande, and uh, Pecos, both in New Mexico and in Texas. So this way, if you look for, say, everything in New Mexico, you'll still pull up the study. If you look for everything in Texas, you'll still pull up the study. If you're looking just for the Pecos, you're going to see it twice for the study, but um, we wanted to err on the side of being able to find things. So that, and then um, the other thing to note is this spatial layer here. This indicates if the um, study has been digitized, the where the study was conducted has been digitized into the spatial layer. Most are, but you'll see here's an example of one that was not because it was a study that was very general and just talked about statewide in the state of Arizona. So it wasn't really um, feasible to be able to digitize in, nor would it really portray the right information to show every single river statewide. Those tend to be the ones that are more general information, general geography. So then we have methods. And so this is um, the table that looks at the different methods that were used to assess environmental flow needs or flow responses. And um, something new that we did within, and I mentioned before, within this um, database that was not in the Arizona database is do a bit of an analysis of the quality of um, the methods. What, how, what, what was the rigor within the methods? And so if you see here, you see these ratings, 2-2, uh, and CA for calibrated, NCA for not calibrated if it's a model. And if you go to the uh, methods table, you'll see here you have, these are the codes for all the different methods which you can see in here. So here's the different flow methods there. And this is the, this year is the data type, so NF, new field, existing data, model data are the three. So you go in and you look at your method key. And so to just talk a little bit about this quality of um, evidence assessment. If it's a one, it means that there was a strong evidence obtained from at least one properly designed, randomized, controlled trial of appropriate size. 
Well, as you might suspect, there aren't too many of that um, within this realm of, of research, just because it's very hard to have controlled experiments when you're when you're dealing with natural systems. So most of them fall in this two category: two, one, two, three, two, two, and two, three. There are a handful that are in um, the uh, four. Uh, there's a number of ones that are in threes because they were uh, the result of um, expert panels in particular. So just to kind of get a bit of a sense of um, the, the quality of the methods used, we added that element. So then um, study elements, this is uh, just a simple catalog um, based on what was of interest within that survey that we did of water managers. Um, of things that they wanted to kind of know if um, they were studied and where and where they were studied. So, for example, um, you know, in, in this study five, they looked at um, they measured both stream permanence. The geo is geomorphology. They did a vegetation survey. They looked at vegetation wa and vegetation water content. Um, and all of these abbreviations again are in um, the key for um, the key for study elements. So that's where you find the abbreviation. And the reason why we put together the database this way is because writing, every time you write in a character, it makes the database larger. So this makes it so that we could abbreviate and, and make the database a little bit more manageable. So then the social aspects table, this is recording um, where uh, the study looks at different um, human aspects of environmental flows, and most of that uh, revolving around um, economics. So, for example, study five used hedonic, analysis, uh, hedonic um, method to assess values. Um, but, you know, there's also some recording of uh, studies that specifically talk about ecosystem services, that study that I have there highlighted. And this is by no means comprehensive because we, if we found one of these studies, we pulled it in. But if you look back at our search criteria, we didn't necessarily do the search just for these um, economic analysis evaluation papers. And then we have our risks and stressors. And um, what we did for this is here you again, as in all the other ones I meant to point out before, you see the study index, which links it back to table one. And um, we put the risks and stressors into both general categories and specific categories. So you can see here um, general risks and stressors, um, altered flows for study nine, and then specifically what they talked about was reduced flows. Some of this gen general, the specific, is a little redundant, um, but we wanted to try to um, summarize the risks and stresses we found. And as you can see down here at the bottom, um, there are 426 different risks and stressors identified. This is not from every study. Um, I'd say probably three-fourths of the studies had uh, information on risks and stresses. So then I'm getting to kind of the, um, the, the meat of the database. We have the flow needs table. And so this is where, and I'm going to actually pull this over to the side because this is a big table. So again, you have the study index, and then we have it sorted by taxes of vegetation, ecosystem, amphibian, mammal. And then these are abbreviations um, for the different, um, the different species or the group. And in some cases, the authors just said bottomland plants. We don't have the specific species in here. Um, and then we also have a, much like with the other tables for abbreviations, <coughs> we have an, a table that, and I'll open this up real quick, that shows the key to all of um, the abbreviations. And you'll notice that vegetation has a um, six uh, letter abbreviation, and um, basically anything that's not vegetation as a four-letter abbreviation. And we, didn't, we don't have the common names for everything, but um, we do have uh, common names for many, for many of the species as well as the scientific thing. But we, we focus mostly on the scientific. So back to the flow needs table. So you have the species and group, and then if the study examined, um, examined the element of ecology, so here abundance, age structure, survivorship, or reproduction, you have a one marked. And then in this case, um, the one that I have highlighted here is a depends upon. And then um, this is a case where it just was information saying that it depended upon surface water. So the information within these studies and the information pulled in the database ranges from very specific, like these ones down here you can see that have 
many of the elements of the natural flow regime. So in this case, ecosystem depends upon 3,000, 4,000 cubic feet per second at a certain time of year, every five years for a certain number of days. Um, and then, actually, that's a really funny number of days, um, which also begs the question, if you're, when you're using, or reminds me to bring this up, we did a, quite a bit of QA, QC um, on the database before we sent it out, but I did find some issues, and it looks like they cropped up again um, in my moving it into an external database between the spreadsheet method we use to enter data and pulling it into access. I think these are actually ranges, and it's, and it's gone, and it's um, entered them in as uh, strict numbers. So these are the sort of things that I'll be fixing as we find them and as other people find them, and which is why if you've downloaded the database, it's good to let me know um, that you'd like updates, because I will let folks know when I've fixed um, errors like that, because there are sure to be um, error, uh, little, little issues like that. But for each one, you can then, um, so if you continue to scroll over here, it, this, this one in particular is looking at surface water. This is the page number for where that information came from, the table that it came from. In this case, it's a recommendation, that's what the R stands for. O stands for observed, and M for modeled. And then you can see for each one of these here, you have um, uh, some details and comments about it. So trying to create a little bit more of a context around um, the flow need that was identified. So similar sort of information for the flow response table, except here it's looking at um, enhanced or unharmed by. And as I said, you know, often we have numbers, like up here, but we even brought in um, uh, information from studies where they just talk about the presence of, and I bet you this, in this case it's either soil moisture or surface water, yeah. So, um, and the page that they discussed that on and some comments, um, either directly from the study or from our pulling the information out of the study. So then finally is the flora and fauna relation table, which is very simple, um, but uh, was it also a new addition to the Desert Flows database, where um, we took different species, and so these are abbreviations for species. So here you have beavers, um, and then um, the beaver abundance depends upon um, uh, cottonwood, uh, Fremont Cottonwood and Willow. So some of it really basic information, but could be uh, could be useful in terms of at, at the very least finding a study to help support some of the uh, management decisions you're trying to make. I mentioned earlier that um, in order to uh, successfully put together many-to-many -many relationships, you need to have um, kind of a, a conjoining table, and so here is um, that table for the database, which is called Index to River. So this is all of the studies in the database, the study index, and then next to it are all of the river segments, which is the shape file um, that are related to that, to that um, study. So in order to um, join these database tables to, um, to a GIS table, you need to be able to make sure that you're um, using this conjoining table. And if that's something that you're not familiar with and there's some information you'd like to peel out of the database, and would like for us to help you um, putting together a query to help you do that, just let me know. We would be happy, we would be happy to do that. Um, or uh, give you some canned uh, SQL queries to help you do that yourself within the database. So just to show you what the, and this here, this last one down here is um, stream reaches. And you'll see that I have these two things. If you've downloaded the database, you won't see selected objects and selections. That's because I currently have the database open in um, ArcGIS as well, so it's created a hold on there <coughs> for those things. <clears throat> but, and actually, because I have it open, I'm not going to open the attribute table right now because I don't want it to get upset with me. Um, so what I'm going to do here to kind of finish up is quickly show you a bit about the, um, what it looks like in ArcGIS. So this is um, our geography again, and this is that same map that I showed you in the presentation with um, the watersheds um, uh, behind the DLCC geography. And if uh, what's on right now is uh, this red, are the, all the stream reaches. I'll open the attribute table there for you. Um, and so you can see with um, when we're looking at just the stream reaches, you have in, in the shape file the river name, the segment ID, and so that's what we're relating back to the um, studies. 
and then a bit uh, where necessary, um, a little bit of a description of that section. So all of the rivers, and I'll sort this, have um, their own number. So the Colorado River, for example, is 14. And then any segments of the Colorado River are um, numbered sequentially, so 14.1, 14.2, um, to kind of help keep that, keep that clear within the information. And so one of the things you can do within the database is create a query to look at um, where different species have been studied, for example. So here is a table join that I did of um, stream reaches where um, cottonwoods have been studied. And it may not do this for me because I just opened up the database. I bet you that's what it is. Yeah, it's not gonna, it's not liking me because of that. I should not have, I should have joined this in my old database. I apologize. But I'll open up the attribute table and see if it's still there. So you can see in here um, what it's showing is this is a query that we that I did of um, the different numbers of studies on the different river segments that um, that um, where uh, cottonwoods were studied. So I had a minute. I could probably get it to display, but I'm not going to take our time doing that. The one last thing that I wanted to talk about, and I do have a minute or two, is part of what we did to pull together this database is create a, um, a layer of uh, perennial streams for the DLCC. And as I mentioned before, this was merging um, the um, NHD and NAKI data sets. However, what we found in doing that, and I'll show you the attribute table here, um, so you can see it's pretty, it's pretty in, involved. It's got a lot of information, but we retained the, um, both the Anahi identifier as well as the NHT identifier in here for that in case you wanted to use it and join with existing um, NHT data in particular. But what you'll see when you look at the gap analysis report or any maps we make, we actually have um, lay, overlaid additional um, perennial stream layers, which we didn't put into this one because we wanted to keep the kind of pure NHC and AHE. So here now I've added Arizona perennial streams, that's from a game, game and fish, uh, New Mexico perennial streams, which is from some work done by uh, TNC, and um, additional Texas perennial streams, uh, which is information taken from the Texas parks and wildlife. But to create a bit more of a, a better picture of the perennial streams in the region. So with that, I will come back around to um, talk just a little bit about next steps. So I've kind of talked about this uh, a fair amount throughout the, um, throughout the presentation, but um, what we're doing right now is we're taking all this information from the data database and putting together a Desert Rivers Environmental Water Needs Assessment. And um, this assessment is going to first be um, available to the uh, CMQ1. A team in order to kind of review and give me feedback on, and that will be in the next couple of weeks. In fact, we're going to have some discussions about it um, at our meeting in Alpine. And really, it's a gap analysis, what has been studied and where, uh, specifically looking at some uh, common risks and stressors, as well as some tables um, with summary information from key species. So even if you never want to open the database or look at the database, there will be a fair amount of information within this uh, water needs assessment report that you could use for management purposes. And I included just an example of some of the summary information that we've pulled together already. This uh, uh, <coughs> pie here at the side, excuse me, <coughs> shows the general categories of risks and stressors identified in those 408 studies um, within, well, of the 408 that have identified them. So engineered structures, non-native, altered flows being the most commonly noted um, risks and stressors to uh, riparian and aquatic ecosystem species. So then having, we'll finish up that gap analysis um, in the next month. And in 2016, we're going to continue to do work specifically researching on challenges to invest, uh, practice management practices for riparian and aquatic ecosystem management in the face of climate change. And this is going to be a much um, broader look and a lot more discussion with folks um, from on the critical management question teams and the steering committee, particularly through annual meetings, and input from other managers and interested parties. Hopefully all of you who are on the webinar today will, um, will help me provide input for this next part of the, of the study um, through surveys and individual interviews. And we'll also be 
doing, um, of course, including the CMQ teams and the steering committee in those individual interviews and, um, and surveys. So stay tuned for that. That's what we're moving on to in the next month or so. And um, with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time. I appreciate you all taking an hour of your time to uh, learn a little bit about this work we've been doing, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, as Kelly said, we have, we have some time now for questions. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand on your computer by clicking on the raise hand button, and we'll call out your name. Okay, so I see Jeff, you have a, uh, Jeff Bennett, you have a question. And, hit and Jeff, oh, if you can hit star six, Jeff, so we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just curious what time, <clears throat> sort of time period these studies cover. So what, ah, when was the earliest study? Excellent question. So I did not um, pull in any studies before 1970. And Thank you. Most recent study is um, July of 2015. Wonderful, thank you. No problem. Is that mute? I don't want to hang up. Hit the mute on your phone. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, you guys have my email address there, and um, something occur to you or um, have a more involved question about using the database or um, issues with the database, certainly if you find any errors, um, let me know, and uh, I would be happy to um, talk to you about it, and of course, very happy to address any errors that people see. The more, the more eyes, the better. Great, thank you, Kelly. And uh, thank you, everyone else, also for participating. And as a reminder, the webinar was recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. And you can access our channel on our website or search for Desert LCC YouTube and it will pop up. So once again, thanks everyone for participating and have a great day.